Thank you for joining us on today. We're excited that you're here once again as we continue to celebrate what God is doing in our lives. We're thankful that you're part of this experience on today. Welcome to uh, this moment of sharing and dialoguing and hanging out with the word, which I believe can uh, bring power and bring provisions and productivity to your life. I want to encourage you to go with me in a moment of prayer. God, our Father, we just thank you for this moment. Master, most of all, I thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor to come to celebrate you, to honor you, to magnify your holy name. Pray, O oh God, that you give us preaching power and conciseness and allow these words to be palatable for those who are viewing. We're praying, O oh God, for their safety and their security. And we're praying, O oh God, that you bless them in the midst of this season. It's in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen and thank God. Once again, I'm so excited that you're here as we continue to navigate our way through this season and this year, 2020, in which we are living in. We're at the end of July, so we look forward to God blessing you and navigating you through the rest of the year. Matter of fact, uh, I want to invite your attention to the gospel according to Mark, gospel according to Mark, and that's Mark, the fourth chapter. And I want to look at verse number 37 for the sake of brevity, Mark chapter 4 and verse number 37. The scripture reads as follows. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. That's Mark chapter 4 and verse number 37 is the said text for our preachment on this morning. I want to tag this text during the sermonic spotlight with this thought and that is this. Navigating the perfect storm navigating the perfect storm navigating the perfect storm matter of fact there's a movie entitled the perfect storm it's based upon the true story the film that tells of the courageous men and women who risk their lives every working day pitting their fishing boats and rescue vessels against the uh, capricious forces of nature and the worst fears are realized at sea Halloween in 1991, when they are confronted by three raging weather fronts, which unexpectedly collided to produce the greatest, the fiercest storm in modern history. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the perfect storm. How intriguing, how interesting, how poignant that we're talking about the perfect storm. The perfect storm in which you and I are facing right now is the storm of the coronavirus, the storm of the cultural upheaval or racism, and the economic storm. All three are happening simultaneously. And the question arises, how do we navigate the perfect storm? For you see that storms are a tapestry of turmoil, a noisy pictorial in which the golden threads of triumph knots against the black, frazzled strings of tragedy. Unexpected storms are a symphony of emotions, a sunrise to a sunset orchestration of extremes. One score is brassy with exuberance, the next moans with sorrow. On the next page, we solo in the arena of loneliness. We go from calmness to chaos, from peace to perplexity. Within a matter of moments, your world is turned upside down and inside out because we're trying to navigate a perfect storm. The pink slip comes, the doctor calls, the divorce papers arrive without a notice, the check bounces, the police officer knocks on your door, or perhaps in 2020, the virus, racism, economic downturn all happen simultaneously. And I hear the, the old folks, the days of old saying, if it's not one thing, it's another. The life that had been calm is now chaotic. The world that had been serene is now storming. You're pulverized by depression, lambasted by difficulties, hell stormed by demands, assailed by doubts. You are at life's breaking point because you find yourself in the perfect storm. And the question arises on today, how do I maintain my sanity? How do I keep it together? 
How do I hold my family together? How do I hold myself together through this tumultuous time where I find myself in the midst, in the middle of the perfect storm? It's not the Bermuda Triangle, but it is here in the United States of America, in the midst of a perfect storm. How do I navigate this moment, this time, in this perfect storm? Well, I want to suggest to you that this text is tailored to teach us as these boys are finding themselves on the, the very skirts and in the midst of the Sea of Galilee, and they're probably asking themselves the same question. Here they are. The Sea of Galilee was a body of water 680 feet below sea level, surrounded by hills. Oftentimes, winds are blowing across the land, intensifying close to the sea, often causing violent and violent and unexpected storms. These were experienced fishermen who were frightened and overcome by an unexpected storm. And as we enter into this storm, as we enter into the midst, in the middle of the storm, these fishermen, they were in a boat on the same lake that they had spent their entire lives. They were in the element in their backyard, yet they were sinking and panicking. Most of us, most of us, most of us can sympathize with the fear and the anxiety of the disciples. And here we have us. So I want to invite you to sit down on the banks of the Sea of Galilee and witness this saga this perfect storm unfold in the life of the disciples. This unexpected storm, this perfect storm. So the question is, how do we navigate through this perfect storm? So glad you asked, because look what the text, the text is stated to teach us. Look at verse number 35, if you will. The text says here clearly, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 says, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross to the other side. Notice what he says. On the same day, when evening had come, he, being Jesus, said unto them, Let us, not, not by themselves, but he says, Let us cross together, cross over to the other side. So I want to suggest to you that if you're going to navigate the perfect storm, number one, you must remember the presence of the master. He is not sending them by themselves. They are not navigating the waters by themselves. They're not in the midst of the sea by themselves. But notice what he says. He says, as a shepherd, as a leader, as a compassionate uh, person for the people of God, as a person who cares for them, who, 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 who has their back when they're down, when they're down, and he says, let us. So if you're going to navigate the perfect storm, the first thing you need to remember is this. We must remember the presence of the master. He is not absent. He is not absent without leave. He does not run away from his duty. He does not run away from his post. You don't have to search for him. You don't have to try to uh, send the search dogs out for him because the text says, let us cross over to the other side. Isn't that interesting, brothers and sisters? As we look at this very closely, it's important for us to know that Jesus said, I am with you. Uh, lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of time. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You can count on that. You can bank on that. So that's how you begin the stages of navigating through the perfect storm. Verses 35 through 37. So the first thing I want you to notice is notice the separation. You have to understand this. There are some storms we must experience ourselves because he says, he says, let us go over to the other side. But in the midst of the separation, notice what happens. He says here, he says, he says in verse uh, 36 and following, he says, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship and there was also with him other ships and there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. They sent away the multitude. There is a separation from the master from the masses. <laughs> There's a separation from what was familiar 
versus what is present. What they were accustomed to, now they are in uncharted and unpredictable waters, but there is a separation. And brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that there are some storms that you and I may have to go to, go through by ourselves. There's a separation. There's a story of a, one, of a man whose wife was scheduled to go to surgery and uh, he, he arrived at the hospital and once he got there, he has his wife and they're running down the hallway trying to make it to the surgery uh, location and they finally get there. She changes out of her clothes and she's on the gurney, if you will, and he's on his way and he's walking with her. He's, he's walking along beside her along with the nurses and they get to a particular door and the doctor stops him there. to says, sir, you cannot go beyond these doors. He said, but that's my wife. He said, he said, but you cannot go beyond these doors. There, there's some things she has to go through by herself. He said, but to be rest assured uh, uh, that we will take care of her because there was a doctor on the other side. And so I stopped by today to tell you that even when you're separated in the midst of life and you have to go through your own individualized storm, understand that, that there's a doctor on the other side of the, of the door. But not only do we see a separation, we see an assimilation. And the text says here clearly, they took him, meaning Jesus. You, you, you can't leave home without him. If there's anything that you want to make sure that you, you, you have a familiarity with, that you have a hookup with the holy, you have an affinity with divinity, you are connected with Christ, they took him with them. So there's a separation when you're in the midst of the presence of the master. But there's also... And there's, there's also an assimilation. But because there's a separation and there's assimilation does not mean that you won't have a confrontation. Notice what the text says. It says here, it says it clearly, look, look at what the scripture says. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Jesus was in the ship with them. And there was also with him other ships. There, there arose, now notice this, Jesus being on the ship did not create, did not uh, stop the disturbance outside of the ship. Said there arose a great storm of wind, the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. So they go from a separation to assimilation, now they have a confrontation with Christ down below. What you got to understand, that our lives are not exempt from storms because we know the Lord. You must know that the Christ has a reason for this madness. The old adage is, is that we're either headed toward a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm. But as long as the master is on board in the midst of your misery, then God can still produce a miracle that will radically blow your mind. So you can navigate the perfect storm if you remember the presence of the master. Understand that there will be a separation. They understand there may be an assimilation, but understand there still will be a confrontation. There was a little boy spending Saturday morning in his play box. And in the process of creating roads and tunnels for his toys, he discovered a large rock in the middle of the sandbox. The boy dug around the rock and managing to dislodge it from the dirt. He pushed and nudged the rock across the sandbox. By using his feet, he was a very small boy and there was a very large rock. And when he got to the edge of the sandbox, he, however, he found that he could not roll it over the wall. Determined, the boy pushed shoved and pried. But every time he thought he had made progress, the rock fell back into the sandbox. And again, the little boy pushed and shoved. He smashed his fingers and burst into tears of frustration. All this time, the boy's father was watching him from the window as the drama unfolded. At the matter, at the moment the tear fell, the large shadow fell across the boy and the, and the sandbox, it was the boy's father. He gently reached down and firmly said, son, why didn't you use all the strength that you had available? Defeated the boy, cried, but I did that. He says, I used all the strength I had. He said, no, son, let me correct you. You did not use all the strength that you had. You did not ask me. I was in close proximity and you were going through frustration, going through exhaustion, and tears were flowing from your eye, and it was not necessary. I was accessible, and I was available. Jesus was accessible and available, and they are in the midst of the storm. So remember the presence of the master. But secondly, you must reflect on the position of the master. Look at verse number 38, if you will. 
verse 38, look at it very closely. It says here clearly. It says, but he was in the stern. He was down below. <laughs> I like the way this lays it out. He says, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we perish? Notice here, he was in the stern. He was down below when the storm was raging above. He was not hidden, he was not hiding, he was not holding back, but he was down below. He was always on board. Notice, if you will. So we must reflect on the position of the master. Why is that important? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, do, 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 do you see this? Do you, do you hear the internal voices of the disciples questioning, will this night continue with mute misery? Speechless sorrows and inescapable hurt. Will this night continue with tears never to seem to dry? Will this night continue with deepening depression when there appears to be no relief in sight? Can you hear the sarcasm? Can you hear the complaints and the criticism in their voice that Jesus has some unmitigated gall, the audacity to be down below while we're catching hell above? But I want you to understand this. You need to reflect on the position of the mass. Notice here. These men had utilized every skill they had acquired. Certainly they had tried every tool in their aquatic toolbox. Their every resource must have been exhausted. They could not find no safety until Jesus. Perhaps they thought it was futile to awaken the carpenter, the dry land handyman, if you will, and ask his assistance in the battling of these ways. They learned that day that trusting in their own experiences and skills accomplished little. Trusting in your own experiences and skills may accomplish little when you got to reflect on the position of the master. Notice here, if you will, Christ, number one, is in the stern of the ship. That's why it's important that we remain below and allow God to remain on the bow because God, Christ, is in the stern of the, in the ship. But also, secondly, notice this, that Christ is asleep in the ship. It may be a depiction of human exhaustion, but also it's a demonstration of a healthy exercise. So why stay awake all night long? And your, your boat is rocking and turning and turning. Your life is going upside down and inside out. And you're asking yourself the question, can I navigate this perfect storm that's before me? Cultural racism on one side, a virus on the other side, and the economic downfall on another side. And can I get through this? But maybe Mark, this insightful and this impactful writer, John Mark, this, the, the oldest gospel, as you will, maybe he's given us an example of Christ in the stern of the ship, but also notice this, that in the midst of the storm, Christ is asleep in the ship. But notice what's happening to the others. The converted is sorrowful on the ship. <laughs> They were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were falling apart. Uh, they were falling apart. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what, to, what was happening, what was going to go down, but they were falling apart. The question of the hour is this. We have an illustration of a person in the midst of a furious storm, and the only survivor was there that night, and he noticed, and he took an outside observation and looked out the window of this cruise line, and he noticed that there was a bird sitting on a rock. And he noticed that the entire night, while everything was falling apart, the waves were, were blowing and moving. Waves were dashing and winds were blowing. But the bird did not tremble all night because his feet were on a solid rock. So the application is this. As believers, we must exercise the three C's. Remain cool, calm, and collected. And know that you can navigate the perfect storm. Not only must we reflect on the position of the master. <laughs> He's at the stern of the ship. He's asleep in the ship. But also we must reflect, we must rest in the precision of the master. Jesus is not in your life for naught. For no reason whatsoever, Jesus is instrumental, Jesus is involved, Jesus is engaged. He has a desire to be a, a powerful force in your life if you will only recognize him and let him do what he does best and allow God to be God. 
do your best and let God do the rest. Notice here, we must rest in the precision of the master. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 39. Notice what the text says. It says, then he rose. Jesus came from down below and he comes above. And he rebuked the wind and said to the seas, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Why? Because the pastor knows when, he knows how, and he knows where. Because Christ rises to the occasion. Notice when they were at the, at the most uh, challenging moment of their time, the most challenging time period, the darkest period of their life, Jesus rises to the occasion. But not only does he rise to the occasion, but he rebukes the obstruction. But not only does he rebuke the obstruction, but he relieves the oppression of the winds and the waves and, and thundering and lightning is riding across the bosom of the deep. And yet Christ rises to the occasion, rebukes the obstruction, relieves the oppression. Because God, in his preciseness, has a habit of showing up just in time. Let me see if I can do a roll call. God rises to occasion when he parts the Red Sea just as the Egyptians are closing in on the children of God. God rebukes the obstruction when the three Hebrews have been banished to a fiery furnace and God strategically insulates them so that the fire does not consume them. God relieves the oppression when he allowed the Apostle Paul to get to dry land on broken pieces. If this history is a mystery, then take a personal scroll down memory lane as you take a retrospective look at God's glory in your own story. How many times has God risen to the occasion? How many times has God rebuked the obstruction? How many times has God relieved the oppression of a broken marriage, of a broken relationship, of a broken bank account, of a broken heart, of a broken motion? How many times has God risen, rebuked, and relieved? When you're struggling with a relationship issue, dealing with people drama, God will relieve the oppression on your behalf. What about when your money is funny, your change is strange, you're broke, busting in discussion? God will rise to the occasion on your behalf. What about when the enemy is trying to block your blessing and bring forth burdens and baffle you and bewilder you? God will rise to the occasion. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He never changes. Ladies and gentlemen, fourthly and finally, we must rely on the providence of the master. Those what happened in verse 39 and following. It says, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Verse number 40, but he had to them, he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can be this? Who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. I, I want you to hear what uh, the message Bible, how it translates. It says literally, the message, Dr. Eugene Peterson said it best. He says, he says literally, the wind ran out of breath and the sea became as smooth as a glass. Why? Because this is a depiction of, this is an illustration. This is a, this is a purpose-driven text because it suggests that the master, he oversees and he overrules the elements of the deep over nature, over problems, over issues, over challenges, over creation. God has super rule. He has power over that. So that's why you must rely on the providence of the master. Why? Because, number one, because Christ can silence the situation. The stuff that's causing hell, the stuff that's causing a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of racket in your life so that you're not able to get any meaning and any purpose and walk in your fulfillment. God says, I can silence the situation. But not only that, in the next part is I believe that Eugene Peterson picks it up best, but not only will he silence the situation, but Christ can stabilize the situation. <laughs> he can stabilize the situation. 
because fear imprisons, faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, faith empowers. Fear disheartens, but faith encourages. And God says, I can stabilize if you will only use the prescription that I have given you. Now faith is the substance of everything of, of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet not seen. He says, now faith. But notice the opposite. One writer said it, said it best that Satan's modus operandi is, is to, manip to manipulate you with the mysterious, to taunt you with the unknown. Fear of death, fear of failure, fear of God, fear of tomorrow. His arsenal is vast, and that's the work of Satan. He does not want you to make the journey to the mountain. He figures if he can rattle you enough, he will take your eyes off the peaks and settle for a dull existence in the flatlands. That's why Jesus says, why are you so fearful? He says, how is it that you have no faith? Christ not only silenced the situation, Christ stabilized the situation, but then Christ exceeded the expectation. Because <laughs> notice what the text says. It says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And I want to suggest to you that in this time period in which we're living in July 2020, the world is beginning to recognize that without God is impossible and that God holds the entire world in his hand. It's at his disposal. It's at his sovereign will. But Christ exceeded the expectation. Understand this. It has been said that the providence of God is always the hand behind the headlines. Understand this, that God is still doing exceedingly, abundantly, all that you can ever ask, think, or dream. You can navigate through the perfect storm. Let me leave you with this song. A little boy was eagerly looking forward to the birthday party of a friend who lived only a few blocks away. When the day finally arrived, a blizzard made the sidewalks and roads very impassable. The lad's father, sensing the danger, hesitated to let his son go. The youngster re uh, reacted tearfully. But dad, he repeated, all the other kids will be there. The parents are letting them go. The father thought for a moment, then replied, all right, you may go. I'll let you go. Overjoyed, the boy bundled up and plunged into the raging snow. The drive and snow made visibility almost impossible, and it took him more than a half an hour to drudge the short distance to the party as he rang the doorbell. He turned briefly, briefly to look out into the storm. His eye caught the shadow of a retreating figure. It was his father. He had followed his son every step to make sure he arrived safely. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Christ, God, Kyrios Christos is that person, is that presence, is that power, is that provision that will give you the ability to navigate through the perfect storm. I don't care what's colliding and what's happening. Whenever the master is in the middle of your misery, he can change your misery to miracles. He can move you from a place of paralysis to a place of provision. He can move you from adversity to abundance. He can move you from a difficulty to deliverance. As long as Jesus is on board in the ship, he can stabilize, he can silence, and he can exceed your expectation. Navigating the perfect storm. May God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer. So I want to encourage you 
to go with me momentarily. Perhaps you're one of those individuals that's here today and you have not accepted Christ as your personal savior and you're needing to accept Christ to make him the Lord of your life. You need meaning, you need purpose, and something is missing and you know that you don't have a relationship with God. This is a perfect time to set that up, to connect with Christ. Or perhaps you're one of those individuals that's been disconnected from the body of Christ or from God himself. You know who he is and you know what he's done and you know how he has been powerful in your life and you need to reconnect. So today is your opportunity. I want you to pray one of those prayers with me, uh, whichever one is applicable to you at this moment in time. So let us pray. God, our Father, we just thank you for this day, God. I'm a wretch undone. I need you to come into my life. I admit, I believe, and confess that you are Lord. And I know that you rose that third day morning with all power. And so I'm asking you to come into my heart, to be my Savior, and to be my Lord, to take control of me. God, maybe I'm shifting in my prayers and I'm praying with this other individual, this man or woman, boy or girl, and that perhaps they are not connected to a church or to a body of Christ and they need to reconnect. So I'm praying to God with them. God, I need you to come into my life. I need to reestablish a connection. And I realize that my life has been short-circuited since I have disconnected, walked away, moved away from the presence and the power of God, and I have valued you, valued you or prioritized you. I need to do that now. Give me that chance. Give me that opportunity. I come now to recommit and reconnect. It's in your darling son, Jesus the Christ name, I do pray. Amen and thank God. Now, if you prayed either one of those prayers, by all means, I want to encourage you to drop us a line, send us a message, uh, hit us up on Facebook or other, some, some other type of social media apparatus or by email. We would love to hear from you. We, don't want, we want to walk with you and to help you to grow and to mature in this process. And I do believe that it's necessary for you to be connected to a body of believers and to have a covering of a pastor. So I invite you to be a part of this experience on day. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you once again. And remember this, you can navigate the perfect storm. Walk with the king and be blessed.